On the Tragedies of Shakespeare by Charles Lamb. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie von Wallichem. On the Tragedies of Shakespeare, considered with a reference to their fitness for stage representation. By Charles Lamb. Taking a turn the other day in the abbey, I was struck with the affected attitude of a figure which I do not remember to have seen before, and which, upon examination, proved to be a whole length of the celebrated Mr. Garrick. Though I would not go so far with some good Catholics abroad as to shut plays altogether out of consecrated ground, Yet I own I was not a little scandalised at the introduction of theatrical airs and gestures into a play set apart to remind us of the saddest realities. Going nearer, I found inscribed under this harlequin figure the following lines. To paint fair nature by divine command, her magic pencil in his glowing hand, a Shakespeare rose. Then, to expand his fame, wide o'er this breathing world, a garret came. Though sunk in death, the forms abode room, the actor's genius bade them breathe anew. So, like the bard himself in night, they lay, immortal Garrick called them back to day, until eternity with power sublime shall mark the mortal hour of hoary time, Shakespeare and Garrick, like twin stars, shall shine, and earth irradiate with a beam divine. It would be an insult to my readers' understandings to attempt anything like a criticism on this farrago of false thoughts and nonsense, but the reflection it led me into was a kind of wonder how, from the days of the actor here celebrated to our own, it should have been the fashion to compliment every performer in his turn that has luck to please the town in any of the great characters of Shakespeare, with the notion of possessing a mind congenial with the poets. How people should come thus unaccountably to confound the power of originating poetical images and conceptions with the faculty of being able to read or recite the same when put into words, nor to author, it is observable that we fall into this confusion only in dramatic recitations. We never dream that a gentleman who reads Lucretius in public with great applause is therefore a great poet and philosopher. Nor do you find that Tom Davis, the bookseller, who is recorded to have recited The Paradise Lost better than any man in England in his day, though I cannot help thinking there must be some mistake in this tradition, was therefore by his intimate friends set upon a level with Milton. End of author's note. Or what connection, that absolute mastery over the heart and soul of man, which a great dramatic poet possesses, has with those low tricks upon the eye and ear, which a player, by observing a few general effects, which some common passion, as grief, anger, etc., usually has upon the gestures and exterior, can so easily compass? To know the eternal workings and movements of a great mind, of an Othello, or a Hamlet, for instance, the when and the why and how far they should be moved, to what pitch a passion is becoming, to give the reins and to pull in the curb exactly at the moment when the drawing in or the slacking is most graceful, seems to demand a reach of intellect of a vastly different extent from that which is employed upon the bare imitation of the signs of these passions in countenance or gesture, which signs are usually observed to be most lively and emphatic in the weaker sort of minds, and which signs can after all but indicate some passion, as I said before, anger or grief generally. But of the motives and grounds of the passion, wherein it differs from the same passion in low and vulgar natures, of these the actor can give no more idea by his face or gesture than the eye, without a metaphor, can speak, or the muscles utter intelligibly sounds. But such is the instantaneous nature of the impressions which we take in of the eye and ear at a playhouse, compared with the slow apprehension oftentimes of the understanding in reading that we are rapt not only to sing the playwriter in the consideration which we pay to the actor, but even to identify in our minds in a perverse manner 
the actor with the character which he represents. It is difficult for a frequent playgoer to disembarrass the idea of Hamlet from the person and voice of Mr. K. We speak of Lady Macbeth, while we are in reality thinking of Mrs. S., nor is this confusion incidental alone to unlettered persons, who, not possessing the advantage of reading, are necessarily dependent upon the stage-player for all the pleasure which they can receive from the drama, and to whom the very idea of what an author is cannot be made comprehensible without some pain and perplexity of mind. The error is one from which persons otherwise not merely lettered find it almost impossible to extricate themselves. Never let me be so ungrateful as to forget the very high degree of satisfaction which I received some years back from seeing for the first time a tragedy of Shakespeare performed, in which of these two great performers sustained the principal parts. It seemed to embody and realize conceptions which had hitherto assumed no distinct shape. But dearly do we pay all our life after for this juvenile pleasure, the sense of distinctness. When the novelty is past, we find to our cost that instead of realizing an idea, we have only materialized and brought down a fine vision to the standard of flesh and blood. We have let go a dream in quest of an unattainable substance. How cruelly this operates upon the mind, to have its free conceptions thus cramped and pressed down to the measure of a straight-lacing actuality, may be judged from the delightful sensation of freshness with which we turn to those plays of Shakespeare, which have escaped being performed, and to those passages in the acting plays of the same writer, which have happily been left out in performance. How far the very custom of hearing anything spouted, withers and blows upon a fine passage, may be seen in those speeches from Henry V, etc., which are current in the mouths of schoolboys, from their being to be found in Enfield speakers, and such kind of books. I confess myself utterly unable to appreciate that celebrated soliloquy in Hamlet beginning to be or not to be, or to tell whether it be good, bad, or indifferent. It has been so handled and poured about by declamatory boys and men, torn so inhumanly from its living place and principle of continuity in the play, till it has become to me a perfect dead member. It may seem a paradox but I cannot help being of opinion that the plays of Shakespeare are less calculated for performance on the stage than those of almost any other dramatist whatever. Their distinguished excellence is a reason that they should be so. There is so much in them which comes not under the province of acting, with which eye and tone and gesture have nothing to do. The glory of the scenic art is to personate passion and the turns of passion, and the more coarse and palpable the passion is, the more hold upon the eyes and ears of the spectators the performer obviously possesses. For this reason, scalding scenes, scenes where two persons talk themselves into a fit of fury, and then, in a surprising manner, talk themselves out of it again, have always been the most popular upon our stage. And the reason is plain, because the spectators are here most palpably appealed to, they are the proper judges in this war of words. They are the legitimate ring that should be formed round such intellectual prize-fighters. Talking is a direct object of the imitation here. But in all the best dramas, and in Shakespeare above all, how obvious it is that the forms of speaking, whether it be in soliloquy or dialogue, is only a medium and often a highly artificial one for putting the reader or spectator into possession of that knowledge of the inner structure and workings of mind in a character which he could otherwise never have arrived at in that form of composition by any gift short of intuition. We do here as we do with novels written in the epistolary form. How many improprieties, perfect solecisms in letter writing, do we put up with in Clarissa and other books? for the sake of the delight which that form upon the whole gives us. But the practice of stage representation reduces everything to a controversy of elocution. Every character, from the boisterous blasphemings of Bazet to the shrinking timidity of womanhood, must play the orator. The love dialogues of Romeo and Juliet, those silver-sweet sounds of lovers' tongues by night, 
the more intimate and sacred sweetness of nuptial colloquy between an Othello or a Posthumus with their married wives, all those delicacies which are so delightful in the reading, as when we read of those youthful dalliances in paradise, as beseemed fair couple linked in happy nuptial league alone. By the inherent fault of stage representation, how are these things sullied and turned from their very nature by being exposed to a large assembly? When such a speech as Imogen addresses to a lord, come drawling out of the mouth of a hired actress, whose courtship, though nominally addressed to the personated posthumous, is manifestly aimed at the spectators, who are to judge of her endearments and her returns of love. The character of Hamlet is perhaps that by which, since the days of Batchetum, a succession of popular performers have had the greatest ambition to distinguish themselves. The length of the part may be one of their reasons, but for the character itself we find it in a play, and therefore we judge it a fit subject of dramatic representation. The play itself abounds in maxims and reflections beyond any other, and therefore we consider it as a proper vehicle for conveying moral instruction. But Hamlet himself, what does he suffer, meanwhile, by being dragged forth as a public schoolmaster to give lectures to the crowd? Why, nine parts in ten of what Hamlet does are transactions between himself and his moral sense. They are the effusions of his solitary musings, which he retires to holes and corners in the most sequestered parts of the palace to pour forth. Or rather, they are the silent meditations with which his bosom is bursting, reduced to words for the sake of the reader, who must else remain ignorant of what is passing there. These profound sorrows, these light and nose boring ruminations, which if the tongue scare dares utter to deaf walls and chambers, how can they be represented by a gesticulating actor who comes and mounts them out before an audience, making four hundred people his confidence at once? I say not that it is the fault of the actor so to do. He must pronounce them, or a retundo, he must accompany them with his eye, he must insinuate them into his auditory by some trick of eye, tone, or gesture, or it fails. He must be thinking all the while of his appearance, because he knows that all the while the spectators are judging of it. And this is a way to represent the shy, negligent, retiring Hamlet. It is true that there is no other mode of conveying a vast quantity of thought and feeling to a great portion of the audience, who otherwise would never earn it for themselves by reading, and the intellectual acquisition gained in this way may, for aught I know, be inestimable. But I am not arguing that Hamlet should not be acted, but how much Hamlet is made another thing by being acted. I have heard much of the wonders which Garrick performed in this part, but as I never saw him, I must have leave to doubt whether the representation of such a character came within the province of his art. Those who tell me of him speak of his eye, of the magic of his eye, and of his commanding voice, physical properties, vastly desirable in an actor, and without which he can never insinuate meaning into an auditory. But what have they to do with Hamlet? What have they to do with intellect? In fact, the things aimed at in the theatrical representation are to rest the spectator's eye upon the form and the gesture, and so to gain a more favourable hearing to what is spoken. It is not what the character is, but how he looks, not what he says, but how he speaks it. I see no reason to think that if the play of Hamlet were written over again by some such writer as Banks or Lillo, retaining the process of the story, but totally omitting all the poetry of it, all the divine features of Shakespeare, his stupendous intellect, and only taking care to give us enough of passion dialogue, which Banks or Lillo were never at a loss to furnish, I see not how the effect could be much different upon an audience, nor how the actor has it in his power to represent Shakespeare to us differently from his representation of Bangs or Lillo. Hamlet would still be a youthful, accomplished prince, and must be gracefully personated. He might be puzzled in his mind, wavering in his conduct, seemingly cruel to Ophelia. He might see ghosts, and start at it, and address it kindly when he found it to be his father. All this 
in the poorest and most homely language of the servilest creepy after nature that ever consulted the palate of an audience, without troubling Shakespeare for the matter, and I see not but there would be room for all the power which an actor has to display itself. All the passions and changes of passions might remain, for those are much less difficult to write or act than a sword. It is a trick easy to be attained. It is but rising or falling a note or two in the voice. A whisper, with a significant foreboding look to announce his approach, and so contagious the counterfeit appearance of any emotion is, that let the words be what they will, the look and tone shall carry it off, and make it pass with deep skill in the passions. It is common for people to talk of Shakespeare's play being so natural, that everybody can understand him. They are natural indeed. They are grounded deep in nature, so deep, that the death of them lies out of the reach of most of us. You shall hear the same person say that George Barnwell is very natural, and Othello is very natural, that they are both very deep, and to them they are the same kind of thing. At the one they sit and shed tears, because a good sort of young man is tempted by a naughty woman to commit a trifling peccadillo, the murder of an uncle or so, that is all, and so comes to an untimely end, which is so moving, and at the other, because a blackamoor in a fit of jealousy kills his innocent white wife, and the odds are that ninety-nine out of hundred would willingly behold the same catastrophe happen to both the heroes, and have thought the rope more due to Othello than to Barnwell. For of the texture of Othello's mind, the inward construction marvellously laid open with all its strengths and weaknesses, its heroic confidences and its human misgivings, its agonies of hate springing from the depths of love, they see no more than the spectators at a cheap rate, who pay their pennies apiece, to look through the man's telescope in Leicester fields, to see into the inward plot and topography of the moon. Some dim thing, or rather, they see, they see an actor personating a passion of grief or anger, for instance, and they recognize it as a copy of the hugely external effects of such passions, or at least as being true to that symbol of the emotion which passes current at the theatre for it, for it is often no more than that. But of the grounds of the passion, its correspondence to a great or heroic nature, which is the only worthy object of tragedy, that common auditors know anything of this, or can have any such notions dinned into them by the mere strength of an actor's lungs, that apprehensions foreign to them should be thus infused into them by storm, I can neither believe nor understand how it can be possible. We talk of Shakespeare's admirable observation of life, when we should feel that not from a petty inquisition into those cheap and everyday characters which surrounded him, as they surround us, but from his own mind, which was, to borrow a phrase of Ben Jonson's, the very sphere of humanity, he fetched those images of virtue and of knowledge, of which every one of us, recognising a part, think we comprehend in our nature as a who, and oftentimes mistake the powers which he positively creates in us for nothing more than indigenous faculties of our own minds, which only waited in the action of corresponding virtues in him to return a full and clear echo of the same. To return to Hamlet, among the distinguishing features of that wonderful character, one of the most interesting yet painful, is the soreness of mind which makes him treat the intrusions of Polonius with harshness, and that asperity which he puts on in his interviews with Ophelia. These tokens of an unhinged mind, if they be not mixed in the latter case with the profound artifice of love, to alienate Ophelia by affected discourtesies, and to prepare her mind for the breaking off of that loving intercourse which can no longer find a place amidst business so serious as that which he has to do. A part of his character, which, to reconcile with our admiration of Hamlet, the most patient consideration of his situation is no more than necessary. They are what we forgive afterwards, and explain by the whole of his character, but at the time they are harsh and unpleasant. Yet such is the actor's necessity of giving strong blows to the audience, that I have never seen a player in this character who did not exaggerate and strain to the utmost these ambiguous features, 
these temporary deformities in the character. They make him express a vulgar scorn at Polonius, which utterly degrades his gentility, and which no explanation can render palatable. They make him show contempt and curl up the nose at Ophelia's father, contempt in its very grossest and most hateful form, but they get applause by it. It is natural, people say. That is, the words are scornful, and the actor expresses scorn, and that they can judge of. But why so much scorn, and of that sort, they never think of asking? So to Ophelia, all the hamlets that I have ever seen rant and rave at her, as if she had committed some great crime, and the audience are highly pleased, because the words of the part are satirical, and they are enforced by the strongest expression of satirical indignation, of which the face and voice are capable. But then, with a hamlet is likely to have put on such brutal appearance as to a lady whom he loved so dearly, is never thought on. The truth is, that in all such deep affections as had subsisted between Hamlet and Ophelia, there is a stock of supererogatory love, if I may venture to use the expression, which in any great grief of heart, especially where that which preys upon the mind cannot be communicated, confers a kind of indulgence upon the grieved party to express itself, even to its heart's dearest object in the language of a temporary alienation. But it is not alienation, it is a distraction purely, and so it always makes itself to be felt by that object. It is not anger but grief assuming the appearance of anger, love awkwardly counterfeiting hate. A sweet countenance is when they try to frown, but such a sternness and fierce disgust as Hamlet is made to show is no counterfeit, but the real face of absolute aversion, of irreconcilable alienation. It may be said he puts on the madman, but then he should only so far put on this counterfeit lunacy, as his own real distraction will give him leave, that is, incompletely, imperfectly, not in that confirmed, practised way, like a master of his art, or, as Dame Quickly would say, like one of those harlotry players. I mean no disrespect to any actor, but the sort of pleasure which Shakespeare's plays give in the acting seems to me not at all to differ from that which the audience receive from those of other writers, and they being in themselves essentially so different from all others. I must conclude that there is something in the nature of acting which levels all distinctions, and in fact, who does not speak indifferently of the gamester and of Macbeth as fine stage performances, and praise Mrs. Beverley in the same way as the Lady Macbeth of Mrs. Ayres? Bovidera and Callista, and Isabella and Euphrasia, are they less light than Imogene, or than Juliet, or than Desdemona? Are they not spoken of and remembered in the same way? Is not a female performer as great, as he call it, in one as in the other, did not Garrick shine, and was not he ambitious of shining in every drawling tragedy that his wretched day produced, the productions of the Hills and the Murphys and the Browns? And shall he have that honour to dwell in our minds for ever as an inseparable concomitant with Shakespeare? A kindred mind! Oh, who can read that affecting sonnet of Shakespeare which alludes to his profession as a player? Oh, for my sake do you, with fortune chide! The guilty goddess of my harmful deeds, that did not better for my life provide, than public means, which public custom breeds. Thence comes in that my name receives a brand, and almost thence my nature is subdued to what it works in, like the dyer's hand. All that other confession. Alas, tis true, I have gone here and there, and made myself a motley to thy view, Gored my own thoughts, saw cheap what is most dear. Who can read these instances of jealous self-watchfulness in our sweet Shakespeare, and dream of any congeniality between him and one that, by every tradition of him, appears to have been as mere a player as ever existed, to have had his mind tainted with the lowest player's vices, envy and jealousy and miserable cravings after applause, one who, in the exercise of a profession, was jealous even of the woman performers that stood in his way, a manager full of managerial tricks and strategies and man finesse, that any resemblance should be dreamed of between him and Shakespeare, Shakespeare who, 
in the plenitude and consciousness of his own powers, could with that noble modesty which we can neither imitate nor appreciate, express himself thus of his own sense of his own defects. Wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, I am almost disposed to deny to Garrick the merit of being an admirer of Shakespeare, a true lover of his excellences. He certainly was not. For would any true lover of them have admitted into his matchless scenes such rival trash as Tate and Kibber and the rest of them that, with their darkness durst to front his light, have voiced it into the acting plays of Shakespeare? I believe it's impossible that he could have had a proper reverence for Shakespeare, and have condescended to go through that interpolated scene in Richard the Third, in which Richard tries to break his wife's heart by telling her he loves another woman, and says, if she survives this, she is immortal. Yet I doubt not he delivered this vulgar stuff with as much anxiety of emphasis as any of the genuine parts, and for acting it is as well calculated as any. But we have seen the parts of Richard lately produce great fame to an actor by his manner of playing it, and it lets us into the secret of acting and of popular judgments of Shakespeare derived from acting. Not one of the spectators who have witnessed Mrs. C.'s exertions in that part, but has come away with the proper conviction that Richard is a very wicked man and kills little children in their beds, with something like the pleasure which the giant and ogres in children's books are represented to have taken in their practice. Moreover, that he is very close and shrewd and devilish cunning, for you could see that by his eye. But is in fact this the impression we have in reading the Richard of Shakespeare? Do we feel anything like disgust, as we do have that butcher-like representation of him that passes for him on the stage? A horror at his crimes blends with the effect which we feel, but how is it qualified, how is it carried off, by the rich intellect which he displays, his resources, his wit, his buoyant spirit, his vast knowledge and insight into characters, the poetry of his part, not an atom of all which is made perceivable in Mr. C.'s ways of acting it. Nothing but his crimes, his actions, is visible. They are prominent and staring. The murderer sends out, but where is a lofty genius? the man of vast capacity, the profound, the witty, accomplished Richard. The truth is, the characters of Shakespeare are so much the objects of meditation rather than of interest or curiosity as to their actions, that while we are reading any of his great criminal characters, Macbeth, Richard, even Iago, we think not so much of the crimes which they commit as of the ambition the aspiring spirit, the intellectual activity which prompts them to overleap those moral fences. Barnwell is a wretched murderer. There is a certain fitness between his neck and the rope. He is a legitimate heir to the gallows. Nobody who thinks at all can think of any alleviating circumstances in his case to make him a fit object of mercy. Or to take an instance from the higher tragedy, what else but a mere assassin is Glenelvin? Do you think of anything but of the crime which he commits, and the wreck which he deserves? That is all which we really think about him. Whereas in corresponding characters in Shakespeare so little do the actions comparatively affect us, that while the impulses, the inner mind, in all its perverted greatness, solely seems real and is exclusively attended to, the crime is comparatively nothing. But when we see these things represented, the acts which they do are comparatively everything. Their impulse is nothing. The state of sublime emotion into which we are elevated, with those images of night and horror which Macbeth is made to utter, that solemn prelude with which he entertains at the time till the bell shall strike which is to call him to murder Duncan, when we no longer read it in a book, when you have given up that father's ground of abstraction which reading possesses over seeing, and come to see a man in his bodily shape before our eyes, actually preparing to commit a murder, if the acting be true and impressive, as I have witnessed it in Miss Kay's performance of that part, the painful anxiety about the act, the natural longing to prevent it, while it yet seems unperpetrated, the too close pressing semblance of reality, 
give a pain and an uneasiness which totally destroy all the delight which the words in the book convey, but the deed doing never presses upon us with a painful sense of presence. It rather seems to belong to history, to something past and inevitable, if it has anything to do with time at all. The sublime images, the poetry alone, is that which is present to our minds in the reading. So, to see Lear acted, to see an old man tottering about the stage with a walking stick, turned out of doors by his daughters in a rainy night, has nothing in it but what is painful and disgusting. We want to take him into shelter and relieve him. That is all the feeling which the acting of Lear ever produced in me. But the Lear of Shakespeare cannot be acted. The contemptible machinery by which they mimic the storm which he goes out in is not more inadequate to represent the horrors of the real elements than any actor can be to represent Lear. They might more easily propose to personate the Satan of Milton upon a stage, or one of Michelangelo's several figures. The greatness of Lear is not in corporal dimensions, but in intellectual. The explosions of his passion are terrible as a volcano. They are storms turning up and disclosing to the bottom that sea, his mind, with all its vast riches. It is his mind which is laid bare. This case of flesh and blood seems too insignificant to be thought on, even as he himself neglected. On the stage we see nothing but corporal infirmities and weakness, the impotence of rage. While we read it, we see not Lear, but we are Lear, we are in his mind, we are sustained by grandeur which baffles the malice of daughters and storms, and the aberrations of his reason we discover a mighty irregular power of reasoning, a methodized from the ordinary purposes of life, but exerting its powers as a wind blows where it listeth, at will upon the corruptions and abuses of mankind. What have looks or tones to do with that sublime identification of his age with that of the heavens themselves, when in his reproaches to them for conniving at the injustice of his children, he reminds them that they themselves are old? What gesture shall we appropriate to this? What has a voice or the eye to do with such things? But the play is beyond all art, as it happens with its show. It is too hard and stony. It must have lost scenes and a happy ending. It is not enough that Cordelia is a daughter. She must shine as a lover, too. Tatus put his hook in the nostrils of this Leviathan, for Garrick and his followers, the showmen of the scene, to draw the mighty beast about more easily. A happy ending. As if the living martyrdom that Lear had gone through, the flaying of his feelings alive, did not make a fair dismissal from the stage of life the only decorous thing for him. If he is to live and be happy after, if he could sustain this world's burden after, why all this pudder and preparation? Why torment us with all this unnecessary sympathy? As if the childish pleasure of getting his gilt robes and sceptre again could tempt him to act over again his misused station. As if at his years and with his experience anything was left but to die. Lear is essentially impossible to be represented on the stage. But how many dramatic personages are there in Shakespeare, which is though more tractable and feasible, if I may so speak, than Lear, yet from some circumstance, some adjunct to their character, are improper to be shown to our bodily eye? Othello, for instance. Nothing can be more soothing, more flattering to the nobler parts of our natures, than to read of a young Venetian lady of highest extraction, through the force of love and from a sense of merit in him whom she loved, laying aside every consideration of kindred and country and colour and wedding with cold black moor, or such he is represented in the imperfect state of knowledge respecting foreign countries in those days, compared with our own, or in compliance with popular notions, that the moors are now well enough known to be by many shades less unworthy of a white moment's fancy. It is the perfect triumph of virtue over accidents, of the imagination over the senses. She sees Othello's colour in his mind. But upon the stage, when the imagination is no longer the ruling faculty, but we are left to our poor, unassisted senses, I appeal to every one that has seen Othello played, whether he did not, on the contrary, 
sink othello's mind in his colour whether he did not find something extremely revolting in the courtship and wedded caresses of othello and desdemona and whether the actual sight of the thing did not overweigh all that beautiful compromise which you make in reading and the reason it should do so is obvious because there is just so much reality presented to our senses as to give a perception of disagreement with not enough of belief in the internal motives all that which is unseen to overpower and reconcile the first and obvious prejudices note of author the error of supposing that because othello's colour does not offend us in the reading it should also not offend us in the seeing is just such a fallacy as supposing that an adam and eve in a picture shall affect us just as they do in the poem but in the poem we for a while have paradisical senses given us which vanish when we see a man and his wife without clothes in the picture the painters themselves feel this as is apparent by the awkward shifts they have resource to to make them look not quite naked by a sort of prophetic anachronism antedating the invention of fig leaves so in the reading of the play we see with desdemona's eyes in the seeing of it we are forced to look with our own End of author's note. what we see upon a stage is body and bodily action what you are conscious of in reading is almost exclusively the mind and its movements and this i think may sufficiently account for the very different sort of delight with which the same play so often affects us in the reading and the seeing it requires little reflection to perceive that if those characters in shakespeare which are within the presence of nature have yet something in them which appeals too exclusively to the imagination to admit of their being made objects to the senses without suffering a change in the diminution and the diminution that still stronger the objector must lie against representing another line of characters which shakespeare has introduced to give a wildness and supernatural elevation to his senses as if to remove them still farther from that assimilation to common life in which their excellence is vulgarly supposed to consist when we read the incantations of those terrible beings the witches in macbeth though some of the ingredients of their hellish composition savour of the grotesque yet is the effect upon us other than the most serious and appalling that can be imagined do we not feel spellbound as macbeth was can any mirth accompany a sense of their presence we might as well laugh under consciousness of the principle of evil himself being truly and really present with us but attempt to bring these beings on to a stage, and to turn them instantly into so many old women that men and children are to laugh at. Contrary to the old saying, that seeing is believing, the sight actually destroys the faith, and the mirth in which we indulge at their expense, when we see these creatures upon a stage, seems to be a sort of indemnification which we make to ourselves, for the terror which they put us in when reading made them an object of belief when we surrendered up our reason to the poet as children to their nurses and their elders and we laugh at our fears as children who thought they saw something in the dark triumph when the bringing in of a candle discovers the vanity of their fears for this exposure of supernatural agents upon a stage is truly bringing in a candle to expose their own delusiveness it is the solitary taper and the book that generate a faith in these terrors a ghost by its chandelier light, and in good company, this sees no spectators. A ghost that can be measured by the eye and in its human dimension, and a well-dressed audience, shall arm the most nervous child against any apprehension as the sight of a well-lighted house and a well-dressed audience, shall arm the most nervous child against any apprehensions. As Tom Brown says of the impenetrable skin of Achilles, with his impenetrable armour over it, Bully Dawson would have fought the devil with such advantages. Much has been said, and deservedly, a reprobation of the vile mixture which Dryden has thrown into the tempest. Doubtless, without some such vicious alloy, the impure ears of that age would never have set out to hear so much innocence of love as is contained in the sweet courtship of Ferdinand and Miranda. But is the tempest of Shakespeare at all a subject for stage representation? It is one thing to read of an enchanter and to believe the wondrous tale while we are reading it, 
but to have a conjurer brought up before us in his conjuring gown, with his spirits about him, which none but himself and some hundreds of favoured spectators before the curtain are supposed to see, involves such a quantity of, of the hateful incredible, that all our reverence for the author cannot hinder us from perceiving such gross attempts upon the senses to be in the highest degree childish and inefficient. Spirits and fairies cannot be represented, they cannot even be painted, they can only be believed. But the elaborate and anxious provision of scenery, which the luxury of the age demands, in these cases works a quite contrary effect to what is intended, that which in comedy or plays of familiar life adds so much to the life of imitation, and plays which appeal to the higher faculties positively destroys the illusion which it is introduced to aid. A parlour or a drawing-room, a library opening into a garden, a garden with an alcove in it, a street or the piazza of Covent Garden, does well enough in a scene. We are content to give as much credit to it as it demands, or rather, we think little about it. It is little more than reading at the top of a page, scene, a garden. We do not imagine ourselves there, but we readily admit the imitation of familiar objects. But to think by the help of painted trees and caverns, which we know to be painted, to transport our minds to Prospero and his island and his lonely self, no of author, it will be said these things are done in pictures, but pictures and scenes are very different things. Painting is a world of itself, but in scene-painting there is the attempt to deceive, and there is a discordancy never to be got over between painted scenes and real people. End of author's note or by the aid of a fiddle dexterously thrown in, in an interval of speaking, to make us believe that we hear those supernatural noises of which the aisle was full. The orrery lecturer at the haymarket might as well hope, by his musical glasses cleverly stationed out of sight behind his apparatus, to make us believe that we do indeed hear the crystal spheres ring out at that chime, which, if it were to enwrap our fancy long, Milton thinks, Time would run back and fetch it the age of gold and speckled vanity, would thicken soon and die, and leprous sin would melt from earthly mould, yet hell itself would pass away, and leave its dolorous mansions to the peering day. The Garden of Eden, with our first parents in it, is not more impossible to be shown on the stage than the enchanted isle, with its no less interesting and innocent first settlers. The subject of scenery is closely connected with that of the dresses which are so anxiously attended to on our stage. I remember the last time I saw Macbeth played. The discrepancy I felt at the changes of garment which he varied, the shiftings and reshiftings like a Romish priest at Mars. The luxury of stage improvements and the opportunity of the public eye required this. The coronation robe of the Scottish monarch was fairly a counterpart to that which our king wears when he goes to Parliament House, just so full and cumbersome, and set out with ermine and pearls. And if things must be represented, I see not what to find fault with in this. But in reading, what robe are we conscious of? Some dim images of royalty, a crown and sceptre, may float before our eyes. But who shall describe the fashion of it? Do we see in our mind's eye what web or any other robe maker could pattern? This is the inevitable consequence of imitating everything, to make all things natural, whereas the reading of a tragedy is a fine abstraction. It presents to the fancy just so much of external appearances as to make us feel that we are among flesh and blood, while by far the greater and better part of our imagination is employed upon the thoughts and internal machinery of the character. But in acting, scenery, dress, the most contemptible things call upon us to judge of their naturalness. Perhaps it would be no bad similitude to liken the pleasure which we take in seeing one of these fine plays acted, compared with that quiet delight which you find in the reading of it, to the different feelings with which a reviewer and a man that is not a reviewer reads a fine poem. The occurs critical habit, the being called upon to judge and pronounce, must make it quite a different thing to the former. In seeing these plays acted, we are affected just as judges, 
When Hamlet compares the two pictures of Gertrude's first and second husband, who wants to see the pictures? But in the acting, a miniature must be looked out, which we know not to be the picture, but only to show how finely a miniature may be represented. This showing of everything levels all things. It makes tricks, bows and curtsies of importance. Mrs. S. never got more fame by anything than by the manner in which she dismisses the guests in the banquet scene in Macbeth. It is as much remembered as any of her thrilling tones or impressive looks. But does such a trifle as this enter into the imaginations of the readers of that wild and wonderful scene? Does not the mind dismiss the feasters as rapidly as it can? Does it care about the gracefulness of the doing it? But by acting, and judging of acting, all these non-essentials are raised into an importance, injurious to the main interests of the play. I have confined my observations to the tragic parts of Shakespeare. It would be no very difficult task to extend the inquiry to his comedies, and to show why Falstaff, Shallow, Sir Hugh Evans, and the rest, are equally incompatible with the stage representation. The length to which this essay has run will make it, I am afraid, sufficiently distasteful to the amateurs of the theatre, without going any deeper into the subject at present. End of On the Tragedies of Shakespeare by Charles Lamb